My first announcement is that more handouts are coming. I'm not sure how we're going to distribute them yet, but um, watch for Wade. He'll come in in about 20 minutes probably. Just, you know, wave at him if you need some, need a handout. Um, let's see. So I populated the course policies on the website to the best of my knowledge at this point. Um, exams are a little bit experimental this semester for the third semester in a row, but we feel like we're converging. You know, there's exponential improvement every semester. So we feel like we're converging to a model that um, really will let us know how you're doing with the material. Um, so this is a bit of a lie. Uh, the general assistance about getting set up and things like that, where I say, oh, post to the piazza. That is a really good thing to do because if you've got a question, I, I guarantee you at this point that there are a significant number of other people in this room who have the same question. So Piazza is a great place to start, except that sometimes it's not immediate enough and you actually want to talk to a human being so you can see eyes. Um, because of that, because we understand the value of that, we are staffing a ton of open lab hours. I'll write that down. Um, and the availability for this week and I believe next week is pinned to the top of the piazza. So go to piazza and look and see what our open lab hours are. And those are staffed by course staff. So that, you know, arguably that's even better than me and Wade because, um, because they are people, the course staff people are people who have sat in your seat not very long ago, okay? Quite literally, probably, sat in your seat. Like, I remember who sat there last, Nate, Nate sat in that seat last term. Okay, uh, so open lab hours, very, very helpful. You don't have to have a debugging type question to go get help from course staff. The uh, getting help for this is managed by the Chara Q, Q -U -E -U -E. Um, and if they aren't already there, directions for signing up for the Char Q will be on the course website and also on the Piazza. So I can't remember whether we've ever been very explicit about how to get on the Q. Okay, um, and then alternatively to that, if you really feel like you want to talk to me and Wade, which of course you're welcome to do, he and I are sort of combining together to uh, cover a debug your brain session. So not as much debug your not as much debug your code, but more debug the con conceptual portion of the course. Though we're happy to look at code too. Whatever. Um, it's me and Wade, and that's every Wednesday and Friday, twelve to one forty-five. It's really like twelve till ten till two because I just run right down here in ECEB. 3034. We are also available via um, appointments, if you like. We're just a little hard to pin down. Um, direct email to either one of us will ultimately get answered, but it's probably not the fastest way of getting attention. Okay, so you know that's sort of the last, and you might not get something coherent because it's the last thing I do before I go to bed at night. So, um, so yeah. Whoa, I don't know what that is. Okay, uh, homework zero and MP1 are available. You can find those on the course website. Reference here. Um, and the, the instructions should be pretty explicit. They build on your experience from lab intro. Yes? It says it's due when? 11 a.m.? Okay, we'll fix that. I mean... We're only going to improve things, right? So, um, yeah, we'll let you turn it in at night because we're doing it all electronically. That's a legacy thing. Sorry. So I'll fix that. The due date for homework zero. He's pointing out that somewhere it says uh, 11 a.m. instead of 12 p.m. 12 a.m. Ah! At night. Everything's due at midnight. This is, it's like Cinderella. Midnight. Okay. Um, any, any administrative type questions? We good? All right, so I understand completely the difficulties in getting your own personal workflow set up for the semester. We've discussed it a fair amount among course staff, and we, you know, we all have different strategies 
we, because we all have different machines and we all have different preferences and we all have different schedules, we sort of have different, um, different demands for our workflow. And as such, the getting set up to do the workflow of this course is a pain in the neck. I will be really, really surprised if you don't run into, if you are someone, you're, well, if you are someone who doesn't run into a stumbling block at some point. So I'm going to request you that you persist and use the resources available to you, namely course staff and me and Wade and the Piazza, use all those resources for handling the barriers that are undoubtedly going to occur as you get your various software systems um, set up on your machine. Um, probably the simplest thing to do is just to use the EWS machines that live in the basement of Siebel Center. Pretty sure that won't be convenient enough for all of you this, this term. You're going to want some more flexibility. Getting that flexibility is kind of your, on you will help. Okay, uh, so we're going to spend the next four weeks or so talking about C++. C++ is this big. It's probably not even big enough for me to say that. It's probably this big, okay? Um, I know or use, I'm, I am fluent in about this much of it, okay? This is, this is visual, right? I'm, a, I'm fluent in about this much of it. The amount that we are going to talk about in the class is about this much, okay? So this is going to be just a little teeny, teeny, tiny example into the most important parts of C++. And um, I'm going to try and guess what some of your questions will be. I think some of you will have experience with C++ in such a way you're ask, you would be willing to ask, which version of C++ are we going to use? So um, C++ has evolved through the years and gotten um, more features as the language. This is a little graph of it. C++. Okay, basic. Basic C++. About, oh, I mean, I, oh, I'm not going to do that. This is a long ago. Long ago. Long, long ago, maybe even. Okay? And it's evolved up until about 2003, to the O3 standard. So it meant that the language was agreed upon to have a certain set of features, including what's called the standard template library. Now, of course, languages don't just stop in place and time. We wouldn't use them if they did. Uh, but, well, there is Fortran. Well, okay. That's a joke. <laughs> it's not a good joke. <laughs> okay. So, so C++, correspondingly, has evolved over time to the 11 standard and the 14 standard. And that means there's an agreed-upon set of features for the language. This class is going to use the O3 standard. Now, before you roll your eyes, let me tell you why. Both of our curricula, the CS department and the computer engineering department, think that the skills you need in the future do not, uh, do not uh, benefit from more abstract code. Rather, they benefit from more specific code and greater control specifically over memory and how you manage memory. That is, our curriculum goes closer to the machine. Our curricula, both of them. Whereas the evolution of the language kind of takes it farther from the machine and makes it more like Python, makes it a little easier to, um, to uh, not worry about type control and things like this, okay, and memory management in particular. So we've decided very deliberately to stick with the O3 standard. Now, I wouldn't feel quite so confident asserting that this was the right thing to do, except that I asked Bjorn Struvstrup if I should. I described you guys to them and our to him and our curriculum and said, should we use the 14 standard in our class? And he said, oh, no, not unless they already know the O3 standard. I'm like, okay, good, yay, justifies what I wanted to do anyway. So he might have said something else. I don't know. I wouldn't have known. I was only listening for what I wanted to hear. So, so we are going to use the O3 standard. Now, you may wonder if you can use the more modern standards, if you like, and the answer is of course. Of course you can. If you already know enough about pointers to make yourself comfortable with smart pointers, go for it. Perfectly fine. Type inference, same. Okay? 
All right, and on all the other features as well. All right, and we know about those things, so if you want to ask, we're happy to help. But it won't be in this room where I use, I'm not going to show you any code that uses the um, modern standard. All right, any questions? Did you have a question? Who had a question? You had a question. Were you raising your hand? Who was raising their hand a minute ago? Raise your hand if your neighbor was raising your hand a minute ago. <laughs> Isn't that mean? Okay, all right, fine. Uh, all right, so... Uh, this is our first class, but wait a second. It's our second class, but wait a second. It's our first class. Class is a reserved keyword for in C++ designed to indicate that you intend to define a type. So class is another name for a user-defined type. And because I want to show you um, a lot of syntax, I, want to, I, I think that this is the right place to start. Rather than starting with memory, we're going to start with interesting type descriptions. So on the next slide, we're going to um, look at what is our first class. Now, did you peek ahead? Did you peek? Okay, that class name is, where do you think the class name is? Sphere, yeah, all right. So class sphere is our first class. Now, I said that this is just how we specify a user-defined type. So what that means is that we expect the keyword, or I'm sorry, the type sphere to be able to be used to declare a variable. Ooh, you have to be able to spell. So here, I have declared variable A to be of type sphere. Okay, any question about that? Now, what's a sphere? Uh, the answer is, uh, I don't know. I mean, we know what a sphere is because we took third grade, but we don't know what a sphere is in terms of our code. We don't have any definition for a, a sphere. All right, so... There's this relationship, class definition here. Here's the class definition. And here's some code that we intend to use that class. Now, we're going to go back and forth here about defining things and using things. We have special names for each of these. The one in purple here is the class definition. Okay, it specifies how we're going to use a sphere. And main here is called client code because it is the code that uses the user-defined type. Okay, so let me write that down just because it's vocabulary that will come up. So um, client code is code that uses a class. Okay, and normally we'll just say client. So main, is, main here is a client, okay? All right, well, what comes next? This is a boring, this is a boring, boring, boring sphere, right? Like, it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't specify anything. But I'll tell you that if I get rid of these two lines here, it's syntactically correct. That is, I can compile this thing, and I will get, you know, a sphere whose name is A whose location has been decided for us um, in memory and whose value is garbage. That's right. It has no value. We haven't told it how to have value yet. And yet, we do have a valid class, a valid uh, variable of that type. All right. So if I were you, I think something about this class definition would surprise me. Looking at this, this is a class definition. Something about it would sort of surprise me. Yeah? Yeah, it's like we're on the same page. Thank you. Exactly. This feels weird, right? It feels kind of redundant. Like we have a block of code delimited, and then we put a semicolon at the end of it. Why? And the answer to that is because there's actually a field here that we never, ever use. Okay? And I point this out explicitly because I guarantee you that at some point you'll be like, my code is right. I know my code is right, and you'll have this cryptic compiler error, 
and course staff will go, oh, you forgot your semicolon, okay? So, so this thing right here is an extremely common thing to forget. Now, there is actually a bug on the, in the code that I have given you here so far. What is it? Do you see it? Yeah? Oh, yeah, I should have a return statement. But the one I was talking about is this one. You actually don't need the semicolon after main. So what he pointed out is, um, I, I'm not going to write it here because I don't have room, that I haven't returned a value for the main function, and I should. But guess what? The cool thing is, the system doesn't actually care if I do. So it won't, it won't tell me that I forgot it. That, I guess, is another thing to catch. Um, yeah, right. you got to figure that out yourself. The compiler doesn't help you there. Okay, so we've already talked a lot, and there still isn't very much on that page. So uh, let's spend just a few minutes talking about what we would put in a class definition if we were going to fill it out. Okay, so my comment there tells me that a class contains functions and data associated with a sphere. We call those things, the functions and data associated with a class, we call them members. The data come in the form of variables, sometimes they're referred to as fields, and the functions come in the form of, well, functions, sometimes they're referred to as methods, okay? So what we're going to expect to see here is a whole bunch of declarations of variables and functions. All right, there's one more little piece that you're typically going to see in a class definition, and I'm going to explain their purpose later, but I'm going to write them now, just because I'll be, like, nervous if I don't. Part of uh, the purpose of a class definition is to provide access. Uh-oh. Bart, can you do me a favor and just kind of walk back there, slowly handing those out to people who need them? Like, pick up the pile and, okay, never mind, never mind. Too late. There's an optimal algorithm for doing this. The optimal algorithm is to make sure you have enough ahead of time. I'm sorry for okay. interrupting your... All right. I'm going to write down these keywords anyway, because those people can see them while they wait in line. Two keywords. These are C++. They're part of the language. One is public. The other is private. And they are the mechanisms that you use to control client access to the members. So these together control client access to members. I'm going to be erasing that later, so sorry. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, that's it. That's the setup. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Who described to me what a sphere was? Who was that? It was over here somewhere. I said, yeah, okay. Was it you? Yeah. I said, what's a sphere? And the temptation is to go, well, it's this thing, right? It's this thing. It's the locus of points that are equidistant from a center, right? Or something like that. Okay, so at this moment, we are going to have a design discussion. You're going to do this for every class that you write, ever. You're going to want to think carefully about two things related to the class, and it's a, design, it's a design discussion. You might have a whiteboard while you do this. You want to think about the data representation of that class, that is, what does a class need, and you want to think about its functionality. Let's talk about the representation first. Okay, I want a sphere. How do I represent it? Hmm, I wonder, what, I wonder how I should represent a sphere. How would I know? How would I be able to characterize a sphere? Hmm. What do you think? Somebody suggest something. Yeah? Yeah, you? In the black jacket with the white shirt? Yes. Yeah, the radius, right? Perfectly reasonable way of representing a sphere. 
Anybody else want anything else for the sphere? Yeah? Very good. Okay, so a radius. And I think what you're describing is a center, is that right? It doesn't really matter. It could be surface. Well, no, it couldn't actually. Yeah, a center. Um, you could use other things to represent your sphere as well. It might be the texture on the surface or the color of the sphere or any of many different things that might be used to characterize a sphere. But we're not going to do any of those here. In fact, in fact, we're not even going to do a sphere with a center. We're going to do a very stupid sphere. Okay? So what we're asserting is that a sphere that is this big is the same as a sphere that is this big over here, right? Like they are the same thing, the same kind of thing. They have the same attributes. They're not the same ones, but they have the same attributes, okay? We don't really care where the sphere is, and we don't have a way of telling inside the sphere class itself. Okay, and we certainly don't have color or texture or bounceability or anything else that you might want with a sphere. Gravitational pull or, I don't know. Okay, so what type of thing should radius be? If every sphere has a radius, now we're going to talk about code, what type of thing should it be? Should it be character? Yeah? Yeah, let's use a double. It's the closest thing we have to real value here. Good enough for us. Okay? All right. Uh, what if I said, instead of radius, what if I said, I want to represent my sphere using a volume? Would that be okay with you? What do you think? Do this or do this? So this is my own little histogram. It would be okay to use volume as a representative of the sphere. It would not be okay to use volume as a representative of the sphere. Go. Yeah, most of you are nodding. We could. Mathematically, we certainly could, right? The radius uniquely determines the volume, and the volume, if you constrain the domain, uniquely determines the radius. So, I don't even know. Yeah. So, we could do that, right? Like, we could just use the volume instead. So, why don't we? What would you have said if I had put volume there? Would you have been like, oh, don't do that? And if so, why? Anybody know? Have an answer for this? Yeah? Ah, it's not very useful to just have volume, right? Like, so if you save the volume and all of the stuff you ever wanted to use that sphere for had to do with radius or surface area, you'd have to do computation every time you wanted information from that sphere. So in that sense, you know, volume might not be as useful, but, but it does give a clue that you want to think about your representation in terms of the computation you incur when you do computate, um, when you use, when you actually use the member, okay? Why else? Anybody, anybody know, happen to know? Okay, uh, yeah? You have to store pi, yeah, that's part of it right there. You have to know what pi is or have some kind of representation for pi. And that kind of gets at the problem. Radius is what's useful, right? Getting from volume to radius not only involves dividing by pi, ah, which is an irrational number. We hate dividing by irrational numbers. But it also involves taking cube roots. And if, oh, yeah, you did the right thing, right? The process of taking cube roots is a pain in the neck to a computer scientist and induces computation error. There's a whole class. Uh, the numerical methods class will tell you, you know, everything you need to know about that thing, but just, you know, that should smell bad to you. If anybody says, oh, yeah, just take the square root, you should go, uh, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Puts the Pythagorean theorem in a whole new light. But it's also not the emphasis of what we're doing here. We're not going to try to optimize at that level. It's just a design conversation that we might have in this context. Okay, fine. We're going to represent this thing using the radius, and the way we're going to syntactically um, specify it, I'm sorry to do this, I didn't, I kind of forgot. The way we're going to syntactically specify it is to declare a variable, to essentially declare a variable of type double. I'm going to put it here, and I'm not going to tell you why, so it's going to look mysterious to you, but that's good. I'm going to call it the radius instead of radius so as not 
to introduce ambiguity. Okay, so we have the representation of the thing. Now, we're also responsible to design the functionality. I'll tell you one thing that we know already that we want to be able to do. We want to be able to create a new sphere. So that's the first thing, the first functionality that we want. We want to create a sphere. What else might we want to do with spheres besides juggle them? What else might, yeah? Oh, we might want to get the radius. We might want to get information about the sphere. We could even get more. We could get, oh, we could get the diameter too. <laughs> okay, so we want to get info from a sphere. What else might we want to do with a sphere? Yeah? Yeah, we might want to change it or manipulate it. That's right. And in fact, we could have a longer design discussion that would include other things we might want to do to a sphere, like morph it or something like that. Um, but we're not going to, okay? This is sort of an example of the basic functionality that we want from a sphere. And that was, you said, change it. All right. So just as we declared a variable that represents our representation. Ooh, I don't think you're allowed to say that in English. That is our representation for the sphere. We are going to declare functions that are the functionality oh God, of the sphere. All right, so let's declare those functions. I'm going to start from the bottom of the list. Okay, I'm going to start from the bottom of the list because the first one will surprise you. Number one will surprise you. So the first thing I want to do is change a sphere. That means I want to take in a new radius, say, and, you know, change this variable. So that declaration, remember we're just talking about declarations here, doesn't return anything. It's a reasonable name for such a function would be set radius. And I want a parameter, which is that new value. So this is going to be a double of uh, named, we'll call it new R. And remember, I'm just doing declarations. Okay, any question about that? So this is just the function signature here for this function that I'm going to use, and I'll show you how to use it in just a minute. Okay, I want to get info from a sphere. So this one looks like, what should it return? Double, probably. I mean... Depends what we want to get, but I want to get the diameter. Sorry, I should have asked you that first. I want to get the diameter. Do I need any parameters? So I'm already talking about a particular sphere, and I'll clarify this in a minute. I'm already talking about a particular, a particular sphere because I'm in the sphere class. So I don't have to run, um, think about passing a sphere as a parameter. I'll show you the syntax for that in just a sec. So there are no parameters that I need here. And then finally, we need the ability to create a sphere. Let me write that function signature for you. There it is. Do you like it? What's weird about it? A bunch of things are weird about that function. What's weird? Yeah? You have to yell really loud. It has no return type. That's right. That's not an error on my part. I make lots of mistakes, but that's not one of them. Okay? What about its name? Is that weird? It's exactly the same as the name of the class. Okay? So those are the sort of the two salient points. When you're looking at your class definition, when you're looking at your class definition, you look for, you look for uh, names of functions that have no return type and um, whose names are the same as the class definition. You go, oh, there's my constructors. Yay. It makes you feel warm and comfortable because there they are. Okay? Now, guess what? The cool thing is that function right there, that function is our chance to prescribe what happens when we do this. So when we say sphere A, the system says, oh, I've got some code I can run. And it goes out and it finds the code that we write. That's a little foreshadowing for sphere and it, it executes it. Okay. All right. Any question about that? So now 
I've got everything I need to actually know how to use, I chose my words carefully there, know how to use the sphere class. So let me spend a couple minutes showing you the syntax of using the sphere class. Now, I'm going to assume that I have the ability to write to the um, standard out via the C out statement. Oh, hold on just a second. Oh, what right now do you think is the value of A? What do you think it is? Yeah, the answer is we don't know, right? Because we don't know what code is behind that. And if there's no code behind that, then it's garbage. So right now, we don't know what A is. So just to be safe here, just because uh, we're kind of in this strange spot, I'm going to change the value of that radius to be something I know, something I can control. And the syntax I use to do that is say A dot set radius. That is, I invoke this function right here to change A's radius to, what would you like A's radius to be? Just say a number. Okay, I'm going to change A's radius to 3.2. Oh, now I know about A, okay? Now I've got control. All right, similarly, I can, as I was about to say, send to standard out, that is, this is, this is the, this, we're not going to talk about this here, but this is C++'s mechanism for sending output to the uh, command line, basically, in our context. These are redirect arrows. I can say a dot get diameter, and what will I get? Yeah? Oh, it depends on the code I get. What do you think I should get? What do I hope I get? Good point. What do I hope to get here? What do we expect to get? 6.4, thank you. So we're going to get 6.4. Okay, any question about that? So this is the syntax. This a dot thing sort of is like passing a as a parameter to this function, for those of you who are coming from uh, C. It's sort of like using a as like the first parameter to this function. Okay. I'm going to ask you if you think I can do something. Do you think I can do a dot the radius equals 8.5? Can I do that? Yeah, but it feels like it should be able to, right? Hmm, okay. I could, I could if this weren't here. Okay, so we're getting back, we're coming full circle to this access control. So, public and private control access to the members. Public says, if you're a client of the class, go ahead, be my guest. Private says, uh-uh-uh, no, you can't do it. And in fact, the nice thing is that the, con the compiler will tell you you're doing something wrong. Okay, that's what private gets you. So everything here, client cannot use. Okay, whoa. So how do I get the radius then? <sighs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I want to do this though. How do I do it? Yeah, I have to go through set radius. Okay. I love C++ because I'm a control freak, right? I can control how the client accesses my data. It's my data. I want to protect it. And this is a mechanism for doing it. All right, any question about it? All right, so that's the purpose of these things. Client cannot use, but public you can. Yes? Yes, yes. So this would be fine. This would be fine if this line were up here, even. Public says go for it. Raise your hand if you know what a struct is. A struct is exactly like a class where everything is public, okay? Same. In fact, the C++ compiler handles them the same. All right, we'll talk more about that later. Okay, any questions about anything you, say, you see here? 
¿Ya? Oh. Oh, I was so proud of my work. And yet, my work does nothing, right? There's no code for those functions. Those functions are only declared. But I want to use the opportunity to make a point. We went through the design process. We developed the, what we're going to refer to as the interface. We know how to use all those functions. And now I can hand off this class definition to a developer and say, go make these work, right? And the only thing I'm going to have to test after that is whether or not they give me the right values. I'm not going to have to test, you know, whether the interface is okay because I have used this class definition to prescribe what the interface has to look like. So all of this, all of this code, I can do without knowing that the diameter is twice the radius, okay? You already know this. You use APIs all the time, right? Or you will. This is kind of the meat and cheese behind an API. It's, it's separating out how things work from what they do. Okay, there's one more thing. So that's, that's actually what we're going to do on the next page. So you're all right. There is no code here yet. But I wanted to make it a deliberately separate step. Okay, there's one more thing. If I were programming here, someday I'll get good and I can program with one hand like this. Um, if I were actually writing the code here, what I could do is throw these two things together with their implementation, which we'll see on the next slide, into a file, and I could compile it to make executable code. That is not what is done by convention. By convention, we separate all the components of your implementation into separate files, and the make file, the thing that you're going to learn about in MP1 and in your lab this week, it's the make file's responsibility to orchestrate the compilation in the manner that you require. I'm not going to spend a lot of lecture time, I'm not going to spend a lot of lecture time um, telling you exactly how this stuff works. There's a make file tutorial, and you're going to see it about a gazillion times by the end of the semester. So, for now, suffice to say that just by convention, what we do is we take a class definition, and we put it into a file called, in this case, we would, because we're nice, call it sphere.h. When I say because we're nice, it's because I could call it frog.h if I wanted to. There's no connection between the file name and the class name. You can call it anything you want. Uh, but, but just because we want to be considerate to people reading the code, we call it the same name as the um, class name. And for main, to indicate that we're doing something that has client code in it, we'll give it a meaningful name here. We'll call it main.cpp, a different file. And I'll show you how those are tied together kind of incrementally as we go. Okay, any questions about all that? Yes? So why aren't, the question is, why aren't there any parameters in the get diameter function? Well, let's look at how we use it. I'm going to answer that question by looking at how we use it, okay? What's A? A is a, a sphere has a diameter, right? We, we can get, we, do we have to say, do we have to say anything, you know, do we have to, do we need to give any more information in order to get A's diameter? No. So, we call get diameter with no parameters because it's like A is an implicit parameter. So we're going to get, we're going to call A's get diameter and it will tell us information about A. Okay, is it all right? So this is the get used to it thing. Are you ECE? Yeah, okay. So this is the adjustment. This is what you have to learn. This is like the, the challenge for you to get used to this having this, uh, this implicit thing that you're always working on, okay? All right, any, other, any questions about this? Okay, let's go on to our second meaningful slide of the day. What time is it? Oh, my gosh. All right. All right. So here we're actually going to look at the implementations of the class definition.
Take a look at the class definition for a second and the skeleton for the functions that we're going to write. And tell me anything that surprises you. I think there should be a few things that surprise you about this code. As it's written here. What surprises you? Yeah? Oh, yeah, that's new. That wasn't on the previous slide. Yep, good. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Okay, good. Don't worry about it quite yet. We'll talk about it in a second. Anything else? Yeah? Oh, yeah, whoa, we didn't talk about that. Whoa, okay, fine. <laughs> it's getting scary. Anything else? Yeah? Yeah, what the heck is this about? Very good. Okay. All right. So these are the three things that I feel like are just kind of, whoa, wait, wait, that's a little different. This we're going to talk about on the next slide. Suffice to say, it allows you to declare a sphere in a, in a new way. Okay, and I'll show you the syntax for that on the next slide. Const in this location has a very specific purpose. Suppose I invoked get diameter on my sphere, and every time I did so, it changed my sphere to have radius 1,000. Is that how you would expect get diameter to work? Hey, tell me your diameter. Right? This is a mechanism for the designer of the class to promise that that function will not change the data associated associated with the class. So this const right here is a promise that the data associated with the object will not be changed by the function. Okay, and we're going to see const used in two other places. So this is, this is just the first instance. To note, it comes after the function signature. And it appears in the implementation here too, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay. All right, any question about const? Okay, uh, let's talk about this guy right here. This thing is called the scope resolution operator. Now, what the heck does that mean? So, this is the class definition. This is the class definition. It ends right here. That is, the code that we're about to write lives outside the class definition. But this is a function name. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were designing a circle class, it would have a function called get diameter, right? So I actually need some reasonable way of taking this function that I'm about to write and specifying exactly what class it belongs to. What class does it belong to? Sphere class, that's right. And that's all the scope resolution operator does, is it scopes the function to its class. One more sentence, that is, get diameter is a member of the sphere class, not circle class or the, I don't know, what else has it, the graph class. Graphs have diameters. Okay, any question about that? Okay, so let's write code. So this is the code that will actually be invoked when we um, execute the functions on the previous page. So if I say set radius, what do you expect to have happen? Well, I don't know about you, but I think the radius should get value new rad. Yeah? Any question about that? If I were you, I would have a question. Especially if I spoke Java as my first language. I would have a question. Yeah? Oh, very good. That's, a, that's even a better question than one I had in mind. Okay? So he said, wait a minute. You said, I said, the radius is private. It's special. You can't touch that, right? Well, guess what? Because this is scoped to the sphere class, 
because it is scoped to the sphere class, sphere class member function, um, the, I'm sorry, the private members are available. So this is fine because we're inside the sphere class. We're not in client code. It's only private to clients. Okay. Does that totally answer the question? Okay. Any other questions about that? All right, I think there's another issue if you speak Java especially. So I want to change a member variable of the class. How would you do it? How would you write this function if you were speaking Java instead? What I'm thinking of has a T involved in it. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you speak Java, then what you think of when you say a set radius, though you use an arrow instead, is that, is that a is something that has a name inside the function, and that name is always this. In C++, this is, is a thing, but it's slightly different, and the cool thing is you don't need to use it at all. Okay, so the radius here is unambiguous. It means the current object's radius. Okay, you don't have to say this. Any question about it? All right, I'm going to write get, rate, get diameter really quickly for you. It's just return two times the radius, and we need to move on. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. We're not done with our class yet because we don't have constructors. I don't want a sphere whose radius is garbage upon declaration. That is, when I say sphere A, I want to take advantage of the existence of this um, function to control what my radius is. What do you think we should set the radius to for a sphere when you declare this like this? What do you think the de a default sphere should be? It should have radius. I completely disagree. Are you serious? It's a design moment, right? We have a whiteboard in front of us, and we're going to have an argument about it. So this is something that should be documented. I mean, at the meta level, this is something you should document when you do something surprising. We're going to make this be a unit sphere. You know, and like I said, there's, there's really no right or wrong here. I'm just going to say it's a decision that we have to make, and we just made it. I made it. <laughs> I'm going to set the radius equal to 1.0, just so that I can scale it. All right. Any question about it? And that's what the code looks like. So now, when, now in my client code, when I declare something of type sphere, when I say sphere A, the system goes, oh, 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 I've got some code to run. Let me go do that. And when I say uh, C out get diameter, oops, A dot get diameter, what do I get? Two, very good. This gives me now two. Okay. Unit sphere. Tricky. Okay. There is alternative syntax for this using a construct called the initialization line. And when I say alternative syntax, I mean you will do one or the other. You won't do both, but they accomplish the same thing. The syntax for this alternative um, implementation is to put the member variable after a colon after the function signature and specify its value as if its value were a parameter. Okay? That's it. I think I would have a question if I were you. What happens if this weren't such a stupid sphere? Is that your question? Yeah, go ahead. We don't need it. It's an or. You're going to do one or the other. In fact, the compiler won't let you do both. Okay? I'm just showing you this because we're going to use it for something different later. So this, this initialization line is our ability to, you know, shove values into the variables directly on that line. You'll, you'll see either way. It doesn't really matter, but we're going to need that later. Okay, finally, finally, we are going to write the other constructor. 
So remember that back here, we had this new constructor that I didn't talk about. It's declared there in such a way that this makes sense as the, func the implementation function signature. Now, in this case, all we're going to do is use the parameter um, to instantiate the radius, and it's designed to implement this declaration. Okay, so all we have to do is set the radius equal to r. Okay, any question about that? No surprises. There's a lot of space here because we could use the opportunity to do error checking if we want to. We'll talk more about that. All right, you'll notice there are three points to know about constructors. That's where we'll start next time. Dun, dun, dun. Hey. So it's one of the questions I, I just realized I didn't answer to. Okay.